Welcome to the Ethan Allen Home Study Museum free Sunday lecture program. Um, my name is Tom Sharpley, and I'm the manager of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, North Country Federal Credit Union, M&T Bank, and AARP of Vermont, and also CCTV, who is recording the program today. And we'd like to thank Snowflake Chocolates. At the end of the speech, there's going to be a box of snowflake chocolates. Oh my God. There's enough for everybody to have one. <laughs> They're milk chocolate creams. Milk chocolate because the speech is about Vermont Milk Chocolate Company. And creams because the people who have dentures, because we don't want caramels or nuts. All right. We have, there's a, there's, a, there's a document on that table that you're free to take. Homestead Happenings that tells you about all the exciting events we have coming up. And uh, so you, you don't need to take notes because I'm going to tell you about a few. You can just pick up one of these sheets. Next Saturday, August the 24th, is the Flax Harvest. I'm the gardener here, and I'm leading the Flax Harvest. We're the only museum in Vermont that makes linen out of flax. And the flax crop this year was a disaster. But we're still having a <laughs> flax harvest. We're going to pull the pathetic few strands of flax that actually grew this year out of the ground, and we're going to ripple them with a rippling comb. And uh, you're going to want to attend that. It says it goes from 11:30, 11 to 12:30. That's an hour and a half. We've got about 10 minutes worth of flax out there, <laughs> so I wouldn't count on it lasting that long. All right. And then um, September 15th is our next free monthly lecture. What's happening in the 2024 election? By Jeffrey Skelly, elections out analyst. Ooh, <laughs> doesn't that sound intriguing? <laughs> All right, and now I'd like to introduce um, one of my dearest friends, Phyllis, who was the president emeritus of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum and is currently the, our treasurer, and she's going to introduce our speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Phyllis. Hello again, it's been a while since I've been up here. <clears throat> Sorry, I croak a little bit, so that's just, you know, this old age business that's coming on all the time. But anyway, here I am trying to introduce Tom here, who is going to speak to us today about the chocolate factory. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? He's done a lot of research. And <clears throat> Professor Thomas Durant this time head of the University of Vermont History Department has been researching the history of Burlington, Vermont. In addition to nominating numerous historical properties and districts to the National Historic Register, of historic places, forgive my uh, messing up, he has guided students in his UVM historic preservation courses in a series of class research projects posted online as the historic Burlington district. And we all know we live in this great historic era, <laughs> a age and area here, because here we are on this land that has been here for what, tens of thousands of years and been used all this time. And it's part of Burlington and Burlington history, which makes it a special place to be and talk about the history of the area. Uh, he's an active member of the community. He served on um, the city of Burlington as chair of the design review board, chair of the design advisory committee, and chair of the historic preservation review committee. He has also served the state of Vermont by gubernatorial appointment as a district environmental commissioner member. He has, was a co-founder of the and board member of Preservation Burlington. So he's got lots of uh, titles. He's worked around here for quite a few years. Um, he's author of the award-winning book, Field Guide to New England Farms and Fine Farm Buildings. And of course, that's what brings a lot of people here to Vermont to look at it and see what's going on. And his most recently published book, Porches of North America, <laughs> examines the social history of this living architectural feature in the United States and Canada. And I think we can all imagine ourselves on a front porch, just relaxing and looking around. It's too bad that seems to have done away with a lot of front porches now, but that seems to be um, a good looking in the area all around here. 
So now to allow him to do what he's come here to do. <laughs> well, Tom. thank you, Phyllis, and thank you, Tom, for the introduction, and welcome, everybody. It's great to see everybody here today. Uh, this is a, a, a research project that uh, I, uh, I started uh, for uh, my recent sabbatical. Uh, I've been uh, teaching here at the University of Vermont uh, since the um, mid-1980s. I'm still at it, coming back in the fall. And uh, so uh, uh, in my, in my latest uh, sabbatical break, I started looking broadly at the uh, history of manufacturing in Burlington. And I kind of, as sometimes we do as researchers, we stumble on something that it just, wow, I hadn't heard about before. And the more I dug, the more it got to be interesting, I found. And so that's what I'm here to do, is to share it with you all uh, today. Uh, so the uh, uh, little bit of setting the stage here. So this is the building that, uh, I'm sorry, this is the building we're going to be exploring. Uh, some of you may know it, it's off of uh, Flynn Avenue, or on Flynn Avenue in Burlington South End, opposite the, uh, the recently built uh, Onion River uh, uh, Co-op uh, uh, building. And it's also kind of coincidentally right next door to the new Champlain Parkway construction that's, that's going in there. So I think we're gonna see a lot more than we used to. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, um, during the uh, COVID lockdown uh, of a few years ago, like many of you, you know what it was like. We were home alone. What are we going to do? And uh, as a researcher, without access to libraries, it was virtually on, it was only online. Or the other thing that I kind of started to dig into were those boxes of inherited papers and photographs. I mean, I'm sure many of you have them, you know, they've been passed along. And, you know, out of that, I came across a few kind of threads of information that related to my family history, but it also kind of connected more broadly. And I think this is sort of one of my sub themes for the day is to think what about what we might call public history, okay? It's the information that we have that's associated with our families and friends, and how can we share that? How can we learn from it? And so on. So um, during this project, uh, the sabbatical project, it also, uh, uh, which, which indeed grew out of, uh, as, as Phyllis mentioned, many, many years of doing projects here in Burlington with, the, with our wonderful graduate students, uh, uh, especially some of which we published online. Uh, I remember working with the, with the museum here when it first opened up and, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. But uh, through this uh, sabbatical research project, um, it was uh, perhaps one of the most uh, poignant experiences was connecting with uh, uh, one of my former students who graduated from the program, Alfred Holden. Alfred, did you raise your hand? There we go. And uh, because Alfred uh, has, uh, is now the caretaker of, of an archive of, of, family, uh, of family history, which turned out to be critically important to tell the story that I'm going to share with you today. And uh, it is, uh, uh, as such, it was uh, during the process of doing the research that Alfred's mother, uh, Burlington Sylvia Heinegger Holden, passed away. And it, you know, it, was, it was really quite touching because, uh, well, I was chatting with Sylvia, I mean, literally you know, days before she got ill about this project, and then things, these things happened. So again, so for that reason, I'd really like to dedicate this afternoon's talk to the memory of, of, of Sylvia Heinegger Holden. So uh, just moving ahead, um, what I want to do is start in the year 1917. Okay, so we're going to turn back the clock of history. And uh, uh, so on February 2nd, Cold winter day, Friday, on February 2nd, 1917, over a hundred optimistic Burlington business leaders gathered in the old Hotel Vermont, you recognize it, it's in the corner of Main Street and, and uh, uh, St. Paul Street, 
to hear a pitch for an investment opportunity to build a major new milk chocolate factory here in Burlington. Uh, many of those in attendance at this uh, Burlington Businessmen's Association certainly you know, were thinking about some of the previous uh, uh, successes in the city, and there was a lot of optimism uh, and hope going on. Nevertheless, the timing of that, that meeting, of course, in, in uh, uh, 1917, was one where there, was, there were certainly threatening clouds on the horizon, if we can put it that way. Um, the United States was not yet in World War I. Nevertheless, the war was raging in Europe. And uh, uh, so uh, there were those locally, however, however, who were looking for investment opportunities. And uh, uh, it was within that context that uh, people were looking around, reflecting on the successes that Burlington had had. Here's the view from the, from the top of the Hotel Vermont, looking out towards, uh, towards the lake. Uh, and we can see, you know, this Burlington at that time really had a very vigorous commercial and industrial economy. Um, just prior to this meeting, within a year prior to this 1917 meeting, Union Station had opened up down at the foot of, of, uh, of Main Street. You know, after a lot of political wrangling and everything else, it brought together uh, the, uh, the Rutland Railroad and the Central Vermont Railroad into this big passenger station, and what a show place it was. Um, but also, barely a week before this meeting at the Hotel Vermont that I just mentioned, uh, the Burlington Free Press reported that the work of tearing down the old railway station would be rushed to completion as soon as the site could be cleared by a force of surveyors brought down from St. Albans in preparation of an entire reconstruction of the railroad's local yard. The old brick landmark, of course, this is at the foot of College Street, okay, uh, right by the community boat house right now, okay, uh, uh, was supposed to be leveled to the ground by March 1st and... Uh, so that's sort of, at, we we're at that cusp of, of, of change when all of this was, uh, was going on. But before we go further, I want to step back a little bit further into the historic context, okay, for Burlington, and especially its industrial heritage. Because indeed, right here in Burlington and Winooski and so on, there are over two centuries of manufacturing with mills and workshops and factories that have been pr producing a very wide range of materials for local, national, and international markets. And uh, of course, we have the, the falls at Winooski. This was taken right at the, uh, at the aftermath of the 1927 flood. We see the grist mill in the foreground. We see Chase Mill behind. But there's so much that's been going on uh, over the years that's really been focusing on manufacturing uh, in, in our area. But with the opening of the Champlain Canal at the southern end of Lake Champlain in 1823 that made the, it possible to connect Burlington with New York City via the Hudson River, and then with the opening of the Chambly Canal uh, heading north to the St. Lawrence River by the 1850s, Burlington became an international uh, place for manufacturing and trade. Uh, and especially during this era uh, when there was still a lot of canal uh, uh, transportation. But by the early 1850s, of course, the railroads came in and, and Burlington also served as a key linkage, if you will, between the Atlantic and the West, between North and South. So Burlington had the, the benefits of geography, okay? It also had access because of the waterways, to the abundant forests of the north in Canada, okay? So wood was being brought down from uh, Quebec and from Ontario. It was being manufactured into all kinds of things on the Burlington waterfront. You know, Kilburn and Gates Cottage Furniture Manufactory. This, this factory still stands on Pine Street, okay? So... Uh, 
Uh, but one of the most prominent uh, sort of examples of the very late uh, 1800s uh, development of manufacturing in Burlington was the massive Queen City Cotton uh, Company factory uh, that was built on Lakeside Avenue. Okay, it still stands. And uh, in 1899, it was expanded. Uh, and uh, you see in the foreground, the electric powered streetcar system was bringing uh, employees from the city area, from Winooski and so on, to this big, big factory. This was a huge factory. Uh, it was powered by burning coal. The coal would come in by the, by the railroads, and then with that huge smokestack that still stands today, okay, that was then, uh, would, would, would turn a mechanical method of powering the looms, okay? So uh, it, was, it was owned and run by the Draper Corporation, uh, which was headquartered in Hopewell, Massachusetts. So again, we have an example of an out-of-state firm coming into Burlington, sort of taking advantage of the location, local labor, but it was, it was uh, uh, again, uh, sure, there were some local investors and maybe on the board, but it was mainly uh, run by an out-of-state firm. Soon the Queen City Cotton Company, however, uh, uh, it, it did become the largest employer in the state of Vermont. Uh, it was the largest taxpayer in the city in 1917 when all this was kind of unfolding. But working conditions at the factory uh, brought on broad social concerns, not only in the Burlington area, but indeed nationally. Okay, And not just this factory. It's what was going on during this progressive era where there was the widespread use of child labor, okay? And uh, this, is, this is a very famous photograph that was, is now in the Library of Congress, uh, that was taken by Lewis Hine in 1909, documenting uh, how children were, were, were basically, you know, spending most of their, most of their time, they're not in school, uh, and they were, they were being uh, em employed in the, these factories. So where we are here, sort of in this 19, uh, 17 era when we're talking about uh, today's story, it's just kind of in this progressive era. People are asking, okay, is it time to make some changes and so on? So it's within this context that uh, we can go back to this February 2nd, 1917 meeting in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the Hotel Vermont uh, where uh, the head of the Burlington Merchants Association called the meeting to order on this Friday afternoon, and uh, um, he introduced Fred H. Roberts, who was the president of the Massachusetts Chocolate Company. Uh, at the time, this Boston-based candy firm was one of the largest producers of chocolate in the United States. Uh, it had been incorporated in 1910 as a subsidiary of the F. H. Roberts Company, of Boston manufacturers of Apollo chocolate and candy brand. And you can see there, one of their factories uh, in, in, in Boston. And uh, so Mr. Roberts had learned to make candy at an early age in Maine and in Rhode Island. Uh, and uh, by 1917, he was a very wealthy individual and he served as a director uh, in Boston's uh, United States Trust Company. Uh, so, also at that meeting, uh, Fred H. Roberts was introduced, and uh, Roberts came in. Uh, he was the general manager uh, and director of the Massachusetts uh, uh, Company, uh, and he had had previous chocolate making experience in Philadelphia before joining the Boston firm in 1914. So, Walker, uh, as we see here, presented a very carefully worded statement to the assembled group of business people in the, in the Hotel Vermont. Uh, and here are some of the details of the investment proposal that, that was laid out uh, on that Friday afternoon as it was described in the Burlington Free Press. Our object in coming to Burlington is to start a milk chocolate factory. We have chosen your city because it appeals to us better than any location we have seen. We want the people of Burlington uh, interested in the new company. We do not want any money uh, except as an investment on which we can assure a good return. 
Okay. So, and he went on to say that uh, they had outgrown their uh, the factory in Boston. They wanted to expand, uh, and uh, they saw Burlington as a great opportunity to uh, tap into local labor and, you know, also curry some local investments. Um, he went, even went on to talk about how there was going to be an issue of both common stock and preferred stock and $300,000 of the preferred stock uh, uh, would be available, of which uh, $200,000 uh, of which uh, would be available to Burlington investors, but the Massachusetts firm would also owe $200,000 of common stock. And ultimately, the whole scheme, if you will, was to bring in local investors. However, the Massachusetts firm would still have control of the company, okay? Uh, rather than owning the new factory in Burlington, the property and equipment would be leased to this new company called the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company by a real estate investment trust entity. Get where we're going with this, right? Okay, so that's it. So um, immediately, who stood up next? Uh, prominent Burlington banker Charles P. Smith, some of you may you know, recall uh, hearing about him, who spoke very positively about the Massachusetts Chocolate Company based on recommendations he'd received from his Boston banker friends. Uh, and as one of uh, Burlington's most distinguished business leaders, he was the president and chairman of the board of the Burlington Savings Bank. Uh, he served terms in the Vermont House of Representatives and in the Vermont State Senate. Uh, and his home, which still stands, uh, we can see here uh, at uh, 227 South Willard Street in the Hill section, which is now uh, Champlain College's McDonald Hall. The other person, the next person who got up to speak was John J. Flynn, the name you may, have, you may know about here. So he was the vice president of the Burlington Traction Company, that electric streetcar uh, uh, network, he was a local real estate developer, and he concurred. And he said, quote, it is a good thing for Burlington. It will help the farmers of the county. I strongly favor this, this, uh, this proposal. He also lived in the Hill section, right next door to Charles P. Smith in the beautiful Italianate style mansion at 251 South Willow Street. That's also now part of the Champlain College uh, uh, campus. But perhaps best known for his namesake, the Flynn Theater, uh, John J. Flynn also served as the vice president of the Chittenden Trust Company, which has evolved into whatever today is M&T Bank. Some of you have been around for a while. You remember we had a Chittenden Trust Company here in town. And he served as the vice president of the Elias Lyman Coal Company. So very, very well uh, connected. So uh, by February 27th, just within a few weeks, it was announced that a site for a new chocolate factory had been selected in Burlington on the South End and that Fred H. Roberts and John Walker from Boston had secured an option for this property from John J. Flynn, okay, the landowner of the 15 acre site that I've kind of marked out here uh, in, in red, that uh, abuts the Rutland Railroad line uh, and it's on what at the time was called Park Avenue, but today, it's called Flynn Avenue in honor of, you get it, John J. Flynn. Okay, so not to miss an opportunity, local investors eagerly scrambled to acquire over $150,000 of stock in this new Vermont milk chocolate company within a week. Okay, some of the big subscribers were, of course, uh, Charles P. Smith, the banker, and you know, a number of the other bankers and big investors in, in, in town. So, I mean, just for orientation, this is, the, this is the factory as we see it today, okay? You see you know, the railroad line uh, that's, that's going through. It's right adjacent to where the, 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 this new under construction Champlain Parkway is, is going on. And it's right across the street from the, uh, uh, the, the, the South End uh, Onion River Co-op uh, uh, building. So, uh, and on the way to the to uh, you know uh, Oak Ledge uh, uh, Park and so on. 
So on March 22, 1917, John Walker and Fred H. Roberts returned to Burlington from Boston with detailed blueprints and engineering specifications for two multi-story manufacturing buildings for the new chocolate factory. Each building measured 150 feet long and 80 feet wide, uh, and they were produced by their uh, consulting engineer uh, from Boston, William Edmondson. These plans were shared with the Burlington Merchants Association and the local Chamber of Commerce when over 200 people attended a very festive banquet held in the main dining room of the Hotel Vermont. Uh, and uh, after receiving a, according to the, to the free press, a quote, royal welcome uh, at the dinner event, John Walker, the newly designated president of the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company and manager of the Vermont Milk Chocolate, uh, uh, he was also manager of the Massachusetts Chocolate Company, confirmed that the first part of the Burlington Chocolate Company would be built on John J. Flynn's South End property, uh, and it would be in the uh, construction would go to the lowest bidder, Burlington contractor James E. Cashman. Uh, according to the free, uh, to the Daily News, Burlington Daily News, J. E. Cashman, who last night was awarded the contract for the construction of the building of the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company, already has about two hundred thousand bricks on the scene. These bricks are those taken down from the old railroad station which is being torn down. Work on the new structure will not begin for several days, although uh, the contract calls for completion of the building by July 15th. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about five months from, you know, to get this whole factory up and running, taking down the old, the bricks from the old train station and putting them into the factory. When work does start, however, it will be done by in the Cashman style, quote, uh, and anybody looking for employment can have it. Uh, like John Flynn, Mr. Cashman was also a big initial investor in the new Vermont Milk Chocolate Company. His 85979 uh, uh, $85,979 bid for constructing the factory was just $133 less than the next bidder, the Keeslick Construction Company of Burlington. So, so here are the plans. Uh, according to John Walker's statement, uh, the new chocolate factory would be built uh, as follows. The building will not be of a strictly fireproof construction, being what is known of the trade as a slow building, a slow burning building. <laughs> Hard pine will be used for timbers and the building will have a 12 inch brick curtain wall with two uh, foot uh, pilasters. The building will have a, a frontage of 73 feet and a depth of 150 feet. Half of this will be three stories in height and the other half, a smaller part, would, will be two stories in height and, and then and a further part would have one story. So then, things are moving right ahead. On March 31st, 1917, okay, we're talking what, less than two months later, right? The Burlington voters overwhelmingly approved granting a 10-year tax exemption for the buildings, fixtures, and property of the new chocolate company. This resolution noted that an association called Burlington Realty Trust, formed by Fred H. Rogers, John Walker, and John J. Flynn, had purchased the property in Burlington for the erection of the buildings that would be leased to the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company for its exclusive use. The resolution from the city mandated that at least $125,000 be invested in constructing at least one building for this new business there during the year of 1917. They really got, had to get going on it. Uh, John uh, Walker also announced at a grand banquet that a huge supply of cocoa beans had just been purchased for nearly a million dollars by his firm and that it would be sh shipped to Burlington within the next several months for use by the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company factory. Globally, cocoa bean supplies and prices were in flux uh, due to the First World War, and concerns were being raised about how workers on cocoa bean plantations were being treated. 
especially on Portugal's San Tomé Island colony. Seen here, barely you can see it on the upper left of this uh, his historic map. It's located off the west coast of Africa, northwest of Angola. Uh, and this is where cocoa had been brought from Brazil in the 1820s, and it was being cultivated. Although slavery was officially abolished there in 1869, conditions among the African contract cocoa bean plantation workers on San Tome Island were reported to be very dire. Concerns were raised about whether they were actually coerced to work there. This received worldwide attention in 1906 when an expose by Henry Nevison uh, published in Harper's asked whether such contract labor at these sites actually could be considered periodical slavery. Although this prompted a boycott of the San Tome cocoa beans by Cadbury and other British and European chocolate manufacturers, the major American firms, including Hershey's and Baker's, took advantage of a bulk commodity trading uh, scheme, if you will, that masked the sources of the cocoa beans. And with reduced wholesale prices for cocoa beans, the San Tome Island beans uh, soon became the largest source of cocoa beans in the world. So April 17th, President Woodrow Wilson formally declared a resolution uh, of the United States Congress declaring war against Germany. Many men from Burlington and beyond responded to this call to serve their country. Here we see a corps of reserve officers being trained uh, parading down Church Street uh, on Burlington on April 26, 1917. Okay, uh, One who immediately enlisted was my grandfather, uh, uh, Durant Furson Ladd, uh, who may have passed through Burlington en route to, uh, from his home in Massachusetts to obtain U.S. officer training at the Plattsburgh camp in Plattsburgh, uh, uh, New York. Uh, to my surprise, this family history, of which I knew very, very little about, but kind of started to come to light during the COVID, digging through some old boxes and so on, also intersects with the story of the global context of cocoa bean trade, uh, which I'll be tell telling you about in a, in a few minutes. After his army officer training in Plattsburgh, my grandfather, Lieutenant Ladd, was stationed in France, uh, and in early uh, 1918, he was gassed. Uh, and he was very seriously wounded while conducting a machine gun battalion uh, in the trenches of the Apremont Forest in the saint uh area uh, in the, uh, the south of France, where he was uh, hospitalized for many, many months. Six months after uh, his return uh, from, uh, from France to America, uh, Lieutenant Ladd was commissioned uh, by the United States Shipping Board to serve as a special investigator to travel to the west coast of Africa to research the potential for American businesses uh, to serve the needs of West Africa and also to potentially find opportunities for international trade. Uh, my grandfather did have a background in business and uh, how this all happened, who knows? But, you know, he is, he's a fairly young man, but uh, uh, his professional report uh, titled uh, Trade and Shipping in West Africa uh, was published in 1920 by the United States Printing Office. And it included references to the African cocoa bean production and other trade opportunities and issues. He found that although during the early 19-teens, the global demand for such items as chocolate had increased, which had produced strong economic incentives for investments in cocoa plantations to boost the cocoa bean productions of, uh, along the west coast of Africa. However, the maritime hostilities that happened during the First World War 
for such raw materials as cocoa beans had created a significant oversupply. That, in turn, created opportunities for American businesses who could get the cheap cocoa beans that were not to be used in Europe because of the war. So you see the context that, that's going on here. So uh, the global impacts of these, these findings on the West African trade by uh, Durant Ladd ultimately would be felt by those associated with the Vermont Milk Chocolate Factory right here in Burlington, as well as by other investors, entrepreneurs, and indeed working families. Despite the tensions over America's declaration of war and ongoing political debates over prohibition and women's suffrage, the right to vote, many in Burlington were still optimistic during the spring of that tumultuous year of 1917. In May, it was reported that real estate demand in Burlington South End was very, very strong, especially for small homes in the new subdivisions near the new chocolate factory, which was under construction. Devin, Devin Coleman, state historian, our, our new, our new uh, UVM uh, uh, lecturer and, and director, raise your hand, because you've done a lot of research on, on this, this part of the story too, right? Okay, so uh, in June uh, 1917, uh, uh, William Schofield, who had been appointed the treasurer of Vermont Milk Chocolate uh, Company, told the uh, Burlington Daily News that the business potential for the chocolate business was unusually rosy. It was also announced in the press that the chocolate company had just received a huge order for chocolate from the United States Navy and that their Boston plant was so overwhelmed that they had to extend the shifts. Nevertheless, construction work on the new Burlington chocolate factory was lagging, uh, reportedly due to a shortage of construction workers, as we can imagine, as so many men were going off to war. Late in 1917, another big construction project started in Burlington, uh, and that was the building of a new syrup factory for the Welch Brothers on the corner of Marble Avenue and Pine Street. Recognize the building? Many of you? Okay. Later sold to the Pennock and Ford Company, the nationally known Vermont-made pancake syrup that was produced here was a maple and cane sugar blend that consumed up to a million pounds of maple syrup per year by the 1930s. The contract for constructing this large brick building, uh, designed by Burlington architect Frank L. Austin, was awarded to Burlington's Keeslick Construction Company. But within days, rumors were also flying around that the Keeslick Construction Company was going to be replacing the J.E. Cashman Construction Company to do work on the Vermont Milk Chocolate Factory project. So this was confirmed on August 24th, 1917, uh, that indeed the Keeslick Construction Company, headquartered here in Burlington, uh, was going to be uh, taking over the, uh, uh, the construction uh, uh, project. And uh, the Keeslick firm soon posted advertisements in Burlington and Rutland newspapers seeking to employ dozens of union carpenters for the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company uh, factory construction project. Noted for their engineering and the construction and engineering of many of Burlington's most important office buildings, industrial sites, and civic buildings of the area, era, the Keeslick Construction Company had been founded in 1915 by Albert Keeslick, an engineer with experience in construction, and Oscar Heinegger, a former superintendent at the Burlington Water Department. Alfred Heinegger, who had previously worked in sales for the Boston Edison Illuminating Company, joined the Keeslick Construction Company several years later and served as the firm's lawyer, secretary, and treasurer. And in this photo, courtesy of Alfred Holden, thank you very much, uh, from the family archives. Al Alfred, what is your relationship to? Well, that's my grandfather, straight ahead. Yeah. Slightly on the left. And uh, 
And I believe this office is upstairs from Looning. Uh, and there's a room there where you can, I think you can rent that room and you can be in that room. <laughs> Very good. Exactly. That's a, it's just, it's just, uh, so yeah. And Al, so it's Alfred Kieslik, the general manager, is, is in the big desk on the right. And, uh, and Alfred's. Uh, um... He's wearing fancy shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so on November uh, 7th, 1917, despite the setbacks attributed to bad weather and so on, Burlington's new chocolate factory was said to be ready to start production within two weeks or as soon as the hydroelectric power could be supplied by, from the Burlington Light and Power Company on a line of high voltage wires that would run from its power plant at the Winooski Gorge uh, down to uh, the site in the Burlington's north, uh, south end. However, a legal dispute over the electrical power lines, the right of way, and so on, was tied up in the courts. And it was only uh, resolved in late November, the 27th, uh, when payment was made to one reluctant owner that they could get the, the, uh, uh, the power lines connected along the right of way. Uh, so, uh, although the work of installing the manufacturing equipment was nearly finished at the new factory and the materials had arrived for the cocoa and chocolate production, those electrical power lines from the hydroelectric plant had still not been connected by December 20th of 1917 due to the lingering legal issues. The clock is ticking, right? You know, you've got carloads of cocoa beans, you've got the contracts, everybody's ready to work. Nevertheless, John Walker, the president, came up from Boston and explained that the new factory would be running by the beginning of January within a week or so, starting with hiring about 100 of what he referred to, excuse me, as girls, uh, to be employed to wrap the chocolates uh, and uh, with the help of machinery. Uh, he confirmed that the company's goal was to have between two and 300 employees working at the plant within a month. As many of the workers as possible would be hired locally, uh, but some supervisors would be brought in from Boston uh, uh, as well for training and management. Uh, so uh, in an editorial uh, that was soon published in the Burlington Free Press, there was a major observation that this factory represented a major step forward because it was using hydroelectric power to run all the machinery rather than using the old coal-powered uh, mechanical methods or even the earlier uh, mechanical water power, turning the water wheels and, and uh, the turbines and so on. So we really, we have uh, uh, a, a major step forward in technology that's, that's represented uh, by uh, uh, the construction of this firm. This became extremely important during the, the, uh, the winter of 1917 and 1918 because it, there was abnormally cold weather and there was a very severe national coal shortage. But Burlington had the hydropower now from the new hydro mill at the gorge. So 1918 started especially well for the Burlington Milk Chocolate Company as they received a million dollar order uh, that came through the Massachusetts Chocolate Company to produce nearly two and a half million pounds of their Norfolk sweet chocolates and over 300,000 pounds of their Juanita brand sweet chocolates, all to be exported abroad through the New York-based Dominion Trading Company. By mid-January, John Walker announced that manufacturing was well underway at the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company with 25,000 pounds of cocoa butter and their Juanita brand of breakfast cocoa already produced. He also noted that they had another order on hand for 40,000 pounds of chocolate flavoring, flavoring for a New York biscuit company and that within four months they expected to be ma making 75 tons of chocolate a day. 
Okay. And then within two weeks, two more huge orders arrived. This time for the Belgian Relief Commission to assist with feeding millions of starving inhabitants of Belgium, which had been occupied by German military forces since 1914. It was also said that the previously announced large order of the, Berlin, of the company's Juanita sweet chocolate bars would be shipped by rail to New York by November 1918, where it would be loaded onto relief ships bound for, uh, for, for, for Europe, and especially for Belgium. The Commission for Relief of Belgium had been established as a charity fund by Herbert Hoover, on to be, later to become president, uh, and others in October 1914, shortly after the start of World War I. Much of the organization's financial support came from American donations solicited by statewide committees. To respond to the flood of orders, the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company published classified advertisements in local newspapers in early February, seeking 25 male workers and, quote, 25 girls for wrapping and packaging in the packaging department. Meanwhile, however, <clears throat> there were some shocking accusations about ground glass being found in some of the Massachusetts chocolate companies, Juanita brand chocolate candy that had been sold to soldiers down at Fort Dix, the U.S. Army base in Wrightsburg, New Jersey. And these were widely reported in American newspapers in February 1918. According to the Washington Post, uh, John Walker uh, was immediately dispatched down there and he issued a report saying that this report in the, in, the, in the national newspapers coming out of Fort Dix has played us into the wrong light with the general public and will cause us a large money loss. The facts as represented, we believe, to be absolutely false and the findings unwarranted. We demand that there be a free and open investigation covering the whole matter. Within weeks, a federal War Department investigation determined, however, that the few large particles of glass, perhaps that had accidentally gone into a chocolate bar from a broken jar, it was not ground glass, uh, had been found by just one soldier on the Army base. And as a result, uh, the, uh, the, the whole shipment from the chocolate company was removed, and everyone, including the soldiers, were reassured that they could start eating the chocolate bars uh, uh, again, and uh, that the U.S. Surgeon General found that there was absolutely no evidence that there was any plot to poison the U.S. troops. All this is in national press unfolding it. Okay. So just as everything looked so good and so, optimi so optimistic, tragedy struck here in Burlington on Thursday night, October 25th, 1918, when a violent explosion rocked Burlington's new Vermont Milk Chocolate Company factory, which was soon engulfed in flames. The following vivid description of the catastrophe was published the next day in the Burlington Free Press. The fire, which has cost a loss of over $2 million, started from an internal explosion, as far as could be ascertained, last night in the shipping room, which was located on the first floor of the small L, which adjoined the main building of four stories. It was about 10 minutes before 10, before a deafening explosion occurred, like the sound of a cannon that boomed through the, the room the sound seemed to come from the elevator well. The flames seemed to shoot from the first story of the L to the top story where the business office of the concern uh, offices were located, and it went down to the basement where the cocoa cooling room was located. It went by way of the elevator and there through the fireproof doors uh, uh, leading to floors that had not yet been closed by employees uh, and they ran out doing everything they could to save their lives. Soon the flames spread through the big factory from the L, and the water that was available did little or no good to quench the flames. 
there was way too much inflammable material inside to fight it with water, and it was soon seen that the building was doomed and that all efforts would be powerless. Six cars, however, a finished product that had been packed recently for shipment to New York en route to Belgium, were saved uh, by spectators who literally pushed those box cars on the tracks away from the factory as it burned that night. This disastrous fire at the Vermont Milk Chocolate Factory came as an absolute shock to the city of Burlington, as three workers were killed. It was also feared that about 700 men and women employees at the new factory would be out of work. Okay? It was further reported that the explosion at 9.30 in the shipping room uh, had uh, immediately cost the lives of the three workers who were, who were there. When the firemen arrived with their apparatus, they found there was not sufficient pressure from the water system to put out the fire. Tons upon tons of cocoa beans soaked in oil were made very flammable, and in a short time, the factory was a mass of flames. The company was engaged in filling the order for the Belgian Relief Commission. So there was immediately, the next day, uh, a funeral uh, for the watchman, David Upton, uh, who was killed in the, in the, in the uh, fire. Uh, and uh, uh, the next day, John Walker, uh, the manager and president of the board of directors of the, of the, uh, of the company came back up from Boston uh, along with his boss uh, and uh, they immediately announced the very next day that they were going to rebuild, that they were going to rebuild uh, on the site as soon as possible. That Saturday afternoon, they had an event at the New Sherwood Hotel uh, and Burlington Judge Charles Darling pledged that the city would do anything it legally could to assist with uh, reconstructing the factory. Mr. Walker received a strong ovation by the group and assured everybody that the investments in the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company were strong, and he spoke in, on behalf of the board of directors uh, to express their sympathy uh, for what had happened, and he de declared that business prospects were so strong that the replacement factory in Burlington would be even larger than the one that had just been lost by fire. By the end of 1918, or by May of 1918, the insurance adjusters had, adjust, had, had reviewed the situation and work was underway to remove the fire charred factory remains. Uh, and indeed, some of the foundations, some of the bricks and the power plant, plant section of the, of, the, uh, of the building were reused and they still stand there today, okay? So um, new plans for the replacement milk chocolate factory were immediately drawn up by a firm from Boston. However, this time they separated the manufacturing area from the shipping functions in two separate buildings to provide fire breaks. And rather than three or four stories high, the building would just be two stories. Nevertheless, because of the national war effort, it soon became apparent that the context for uh, making chocolate was, was changing. Within days of announcing the reconstruction, the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company purchased a 35-year-old factory building on the Burlington waterfront uh, in downtown at the corner of Main Street and Battery Street. Okay, so in reference, this is a, a Sanborn map Main Street on the bottom, Battery Street on the left, Waterfront uh, uh, to the left, and the, the, the pink Adams Mission Home is, is now the, uh, the Pomelo, Pomelo Agency, okay? And you get Burlington, uh, Church Street, and so on uh, off to the right. So there's a big, big factory uh, down there, um, and this factory had been used for manufacturing uh, uh, wooden boxes, at that point, when they bought the factory, it had been making wooden ammunition boxes for the World War effort. Uh, and it was assumed that uh, the chocolate factory would be using this maybe for making shipping cases and so on. However, it soon became clear that it had something quite different in mind. Within days, they started demolishing this factory because there was this national shortage of, of, of building supplies. So they took down this factory, uh, a force of 100 men 
under the direction of the Keesler Construction Company, had that building completely, that this, this factory completely taken down in a number of days. Okay? All the heavy trucks in the area that were available were brought in to cart the heavy timbers, the wood, the bricks, everything they could down to what's now Flint Avenue to reconstruct the new chocolate factory because they had contracts to fill. They had workers they wanted to get going. All hands on deck. Anybody who said, anybody in Burlington who wants work can get a job. Just, just, just come right down. Uh, so, uh, and indeed, it, it continued. Uh, within, within months, uh, John Walker announced that the Vermont Milk Chocolate uh, Company had accepted another huge $1.5 million contract from the Belgian government to produce another 4.5 million tons of chocolate, okay? including their, uh, their uh, uh, baking uh, uh, cocoa, all to be shipped by September of 1918. The clock is ticking. I mean, you know, uh, it, was pay, it, was, it was reported, however, during this period that the Burlington employees were, employees were still being paid, that a lot of the material had been temporarily stored in boxcars, uh, and they were just scrambling to try to rebuild as, as soon as possible. But then we had something else that came along. Okay. On August 6, 1918, an ominous challenge was reported. And that is when crew members of a standard oil uh, a steamer were taken off of this uh, a, a boat on Lake Champlain. They were brought into Virgins because they had contracted the dreaded Spanish influenza. Uh, within weeks, okay, within weeks, this influenza epidemic had spread across the U.S., had uh, across Europe, and it was in Burlington. Okay, so many people in Burlington soon contracted the disease uh, that the Ethan Allen Club that was on, on College Street had to be converted into a temporary hospital. The hospitals were full, uh, rest homes, every, it was, how every, families broadly were, 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 were stricken with the disease. Among those immediately stricken by the illness were the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company president, John Walker, and his 20-year-old son. Both received care at the Green Mountain Sanitarium on Pearl Street in Burlington for several days. They went home by train, but with, after a weekend break, John Walker was back to announce that the new chocolate factory would resume production within a week, nevertheless, and would be running by full by the start of 1919. It was also announced that he had more contracts. Uh, by October, it was reported that the influenza epidemic uh, in Burlington, people were getting better every day. Uh, and that, uh, uh, however, due to the illness, uh, there were a, a, a seriously limited number of construction workers available to build, rebuild the factory that had just burned down. Uh, so that was being delayed. Uh, nevertheless, there were those, those, the pressure for, for those uh, contracts. Although the Burlington Water Department had worked to improve the volume and pressure of the water, to be delivered to the rebuilt Vermont Milk Chocolate Factory, the insurance companies and city fire commissioners demanded that tests be conducted to make sure there's going to be enough water pressure in case something else uh, happened again. Uh, it came up to the Board of Aldermen, and to address these concerns, the Burlington Board of Aldermen unanimous, unanimously approved allocating funds to lay 3,000 feet of new 12-inch cast iron pipe in a new ditch running south along Pine Street from Lakeside Avenue to Park Avenue to serve the chocolate factory and to the nearby neighborhoods. City tax funds immediately. Everybody out, dig the ditch, get the water down there so they can open the factory uh, and, uh, and so on. Within three weeks, they had that fact that that uh, that, that that trench was 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 being dug, 
and that and that water line was being being laid. They 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 were taking advantage of the the federal uh, um, situation to say that it was a priority that got around all kinds of embargoes and so on on the on materials because of the war effort to get the pipes. Uh, meanwhile, uh, to fight the uh, 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 the fight was going on in the Great War. Uh, uh, soldiers were still being uh, certainly being shipped uh, uh, from from New York and, and and so on. However, in November 11th of 1918, it was announced that an armistice had been reached, and a grand victory parade was uh, uh, held here in downtown Burlington, uh, um, celebrating the end of the war. Within days, the Burlington Free Press featured an article headlining, Burlington manufacturers expect prosperity for many years and are not worrying about any reaction following the end of the war. John Walker uh, cannot foresee any let up in his business to come. Uh, he is of the opinion that prosperity will be unparalleled through the country without any effort of a kind. Uh, we will be going full speed ahead for two years and probably much longer because of the, the orders that would be coming in. 1919, however, started with a rather inauspicious omen for the top uh, uh, officers of the uh, Burlington uh, Milk Chocolate, or Vermont Milk Chocolate Factory, uh, when shortly after six o'clock in the morning, on January 2nd, 1919, uh, the Central Vermont Railway's overnight sleeper car from Boston crashed into a line of empty freight cars at the Winooski Railroad Station and on board in the Pullman car were John Walker and Fred H. Roberts. Fortunately, neither of them were injured, uh, uh, but it was a big embarrassing train wreck uh, uh, to start the year. Nevertheless, with continued optimism, uh, the F8 Roberts Company, John Walker, continued to talk up uh, the prospects for the uh, uh, Burlington-based uh, 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 Vermont Milk Chocolate Company, uh, and they even soon took out advertisements uh, that, in essence, were trying to sell more stock. Okay, uh, and. Uh, so the notice for the SOC announcement signed by John Walker stated it has always been the policy of the management to never pay dividends on common stock until the surplus is equal to 60% of the preferred. And I mean, you can, you can see uh, they're, they're looking for more investment uh, uh, locally. Okay, within two months, uh, John Walker with his son took a trip to Havana, Cuba, Cuba, uh, and there they negotiated the purchase of large volumes of cane sugar to be used in the manufacture of, uh, of chocolate to be made at the Vermont Milk Chocolate uh, uh, Factory. His plan was to further expand the factory uh, uh, down there with uh, uh, another uh, uh, big building uh, and uh, the, these other buildings would be making labels and uh, doing the packaging and so on. Uh, it was also reported uh, at the time uh, that John Walker's son-in-law, Ernest A. Linderholm, had purchased a new home for his family, and his wife, Mrs. Linderholm, uh, the former Natalie Walker, uh, uh, had become very involved in, uh, in, in the Burlington uh, political scene, and so on, serving as a ballot clerk in Burlington's Ward 6 in September of 1920, which was the first Vermont state primary election when over a thousand new voters, mainly women, were added to the city checklist uh, after the recent federal ratification of the 19th Amendment of the Constitution, uh, providing for equal rights for women to vote in the United States. Uh, a Phi Beta uh, Kappa Radcliffe graduate, Natalie Walker Linderholm, who later become nationally known for her leadership in social service groups, including the Vermont Children's Aid Society, the Family Welfare Society of Boston, 
the Russell Sage Foundation, and the American Women's Foundation. With a bold headline in the Burlington Daily News announcing new industry to hire 500 persons, uh, there was an explanation that yet another new brick factory uh, would soon go up down at the site of the uh, Vermont Milk uh, Chocolate Factory site. But this one was going to be conveyed to the Miller Milk Chocolate Company, which was allied with the F.H. Roberts Company, the parent firm of the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company. You ever heard of the name Ponzi? Mm, things start to get interesting here. Okay. George Miller was the president of the Miller Chocolate Company. John Walker served as his treasurer, and although the two companies would be sharing the same factory building, it was stressed in the news that they would be run as separate businesses and that George Miller would move to Burlington. And anyway, things were getting rather complicated. To accommodate the plans, uh, it was announced that this new addition on the north, which still stands today, uh, would be, would be uh, leased out uh, and uh, that more big contracts had just, just come in uh, 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 with that. With World War II over uh, on July 4th, 1919, there was a huge celebration here in Burlington, as you can well, well imagine. It was a really hot summer day, and uh, uh, chocolates were distributed to, uh, to folks on Church Street in the parade, but it was so hot uh, that not everybody hung out downtown. A lot of people went out for the car. Alfred Holden, thank you very much for your family archives. There's the family in their touring car, and they took a little drive. I'm not sure if they went there, but just about everybody else went down to North Beach, where there was the big opening uh, of North Beach. Everybody, this, is, this is July 4th, uh, 1919. Uh, and to top off the festivities, a seaplane actually landed on the beach. This is pretty new technology. And uh, uh, so anyway. OK. So although the stock market, the American stock market, had been surging during the summer of 19, 19, there were also huge waves of underlying economic uncertainties going on. The war was over, okay? What about all of those soldiers coming back? What was going on with the economy uh, and so on? What was going on with consumer demand? What was going on with inflation? There was an awful lot uh, uh, of concerns uh, that were sort of getting, uh, getting people worried. Nevertheless, John Walker, uh, had an interview in the Burlington Free Press, and he, and he, he, he uh, uh, you know, went out to say, there is no sound reason why Burlington, if it shows proper spirit, should not be a model city and double the population in the next 10 years. Uh, not only can we double the, the population, but we can triple the tax property. To do this, two things are needed, good roads and high-class houses. Everything else will take care of itself. Progressive ideas must be used from now, and we must be going, getting started immediately. So uh, uh, at the time, however, there were issues with housing, serious issues with housing, as you can imagine, because this big factory came in, there was a huge demand for it. Where were the people going to be living? For this project, I, I spent a fair amount of time scanning through the city directories and finding that many of the workers, employee VTM, Vermont Milk Chocolate Company, were actually rooming and boarding in houses scattered all over the city. Old North End, all over, you know, and it, it, there was a housing shortage, a huge housing shortage. So nevertheless, ironically, on the same day that John Walker made his big speech about the big opportunities in Burlington, there was a strike. What happened was that a hundred of the women who were working uh, in the chocolate wrapping department were told that their summer piecework pay raise was going to be reduced. Middle of the summer, it's hot, and they're told their pay is going to be cut. 
They were not pleased. Okay? A few stayed to work, but most of them walked out in the morning. Okay? So far, so good until lunch break. The, the women who had stayed inside came outside. Tensions, you can imagine, uh, boiled over. And the, uh, uh, the head of the department, Everett Bach, ordered his assistant foreman, Henry Lapointe, to go out and quell the strikers. In the chaos, one of the women, Miss Harriet Garvey, was injured. After losing consciousness, she was taken home by ambulance. The striking workers, the women striking workers, were of course furious. They demanded to meet with President Walker immediately, promising to quit if they didn't get their pay raise back right then and now. Uh, Henry Lapointe, the one who had tried to quell the unrest, was immediately arrested, charged with breach of peace, uh, and he was put on bail uh, pending a, uh, a hearing in city court. The next morning, 20 mail workers in the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company shipping department declared they would also go on strike. On Thursday, even a larger number of workers at the factory said they were going to go on strike unless they would get an eight-hour workday and an increase of 15% in work in, in wages. About 300 of the chocolate company workers met that evening in downtown Burlington to discuss forming a new trade union associated with the American Federation of Labor. President John Walker, of course, is back in Boston, got on the next train, came up the rush back to Burlington, and on that Saturday, July 26, he informed the press that the employment matter had stemmed from a misunderstanding, uh, that the previous pay raise had not been approved by him, uh, and he said, I consider this strike to be very ill-advised. I consider that it was very poorly handled, both by the employees and the representatives of our company. It could have been easily avoided if somebody had just gotten in touch with me uh, and we would have worked it out. Yeah, yeah, okay. But because it was so hot, he said he would approve the, uh, the piecework rate, uh, rate of two and a half cents per carton of these Norfolk suites until the 1st of September for the female workers. Uh, at that time, the male workers were being paid hourly wages. The women were being paid piecework in the hot factory, no air conditioning. Mr. Walker went on to say, we are not going to employ any strikers. We're going to keep an open shop, meaning no union. Any worker who is willing to live up to the rules, we shall welcome back on Monday morning. But anyone who is dissatisfied, we believe it is part of good business, both for them and for ourselves, that they should seek employment elsewhere. It was probably the free press. John Walker's patience had clearly run out, okay? That next Monday, he issued a sharply worded statement uh, to the, uh, uh, okay, let's get the hit on that one, um, to, the fr to the press saying, this strike is the last straw, as it has shown perfectly plain that we would be committing suicide from a financial standpoint if we brought the Miller Candy Company up here, employing 400 people, where there's a shortage of help, a shortage of housing, poor streets, and a city government whose hands were practically tied by nearly being nearly equally divided between progressive and reactionaries, and we would be caught between two fires. John Walker also said in frustration, we've decided to locate our Miller factory uh, elsewhere uh, because we are paying an equal amount in Boston, where 90% of our help is efficient, and in Burlington, only about 60% of our help are efficient, and the other 40% just want more wages. All right. So uh, on Monday, uh, July 28th, which are happening fast, 1919, uh, the Burlington Daily News published an article headline, Facing the Truth, and observed that the loss of the Miller Candy Company uh, ought to lead to a sharp awakening in Burlington. We want more houses, better streets, good fire protection, Everything, in fact, that a progressive city should offer to those it would have to come to locate within its borders. On the eve of promised industrial expansion, it would surely be regrettable to have our plans miscarry. 
Burlington is due for a very busy time in the immediate future uh, if her son is to remain in the ascendant. Newspaper editors in neighboring Vermont manufacturing communities also weighed in on the disappointing situation in Burlington. The Swanton Courier commented, we believe President Walker of the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company has given Burlington people to understand that it would be folly to establish the Milk Candy Company in a city with general working conditions so unsatisfactory and fire protection so inadequate as in Burlington. Thus, they have lost a desirable and sizable industry because they, as a city, have failed to measure up to what, in the opinion of the directors of the concern, a town should be to deserve an industry of that character. Okay. Um, and... Uh, uh, so, uh, so and, and here, we, here we also have uh, a clip it from a, uh, an editorial uh, where the Virgin's Enterprise uh, could uh, snipe in a little bit on the situation, uh, saying, when Burlington landed a big milk chocolate factory, it seemed as though the long her herald new era had at last dawned, and the city would keep up the stride, which would justify a raid on the state treasury of $200,000 for a barge terminal in Burlington that it was about to become, as it was about to become a great industrial center. Alas, that bubble should have soon been pricked. The president of the chocolate company has made it plain uh, that if they were to do it over again, it was doubtful that the company would go to the Queen City. While this is not complimentary in Burlington, it correctly describes the situation. If Burlington wants a few hundred thousand more, uh, uh, which the chocolate company deserves to invest, it will have to adopt a different attitude towards big business. So for a broader global context, however, this was happening within a cascade of historically significant global, national, and local events that were unfolding during the summer of 1919 as the progressive era came to a turbulent close. Although the war in Europe was over, the world was changing rapidly in ways that would have long-standing repercussions. In July of that year, race riots in Washington, D.C. prompted martial law to be declared. Although ill and soon suffering from a debilitating stroke, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, who had supported racial segregation, authorized military troops to occupy the nation's capital to quell the violence. The United States House of Representatives passed an act to enforce the prohibition of alcoholic beverages on the, lo on the federal level, a key step towards the imp imposition of prohibition nationally. And labor unrest during that July included a strike of 40,000 maritime workers demanding wage increases that blocked all shipping on most of the American East Coast and in the Gulf of Mexico ports. Crisis had, 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 had come to America. On August, 19, uh, on August 11th, 1919, it was reported that the strike was over uh, at, the Burl at, the, uh, at the Burlington factory and that 160 female workers uh, would be uh, returning uh, to, uh, to wrap chocolate bars. The breach of peace uh, charges against Henry LaPointe uh, were uh, dismissed uh, and work at the factory continued. Nevertheless, uh, in November of that year, John Walker admitted that there were, because of the various shortages of sugar brought on by those, those uh, strikes along the waterfront, that there was a huge shortage of sugar, and as a result, uh, the uh, production at the Burlington factory would be virtually shut down. Uh, well, I'm waiting until we get there. Waiting until we get there, because, okay, uh, they are right. <laughs> um, it was also, he also announced that a $1.5 million shipment of cocoa beans from that West African island of San Tome had just been purchased in Lisbon, Portugal for the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company and that the Massachusetts Company would soon be combining to put them into production. So they were still buying cocoa beans. Nevertheless, as I was saying, this 
Portuguese colony of San Tomé, which had just become the world's largest exporter of cocoa beans, at that time, within a month or so, there was a major infestation of thrips, okay? And these thrips virtually destroyed the crop on that African island. The result was a huge increase in the global price of cocoa beans. Coincidentally, a similar spread of these invasive insects, these thrips, has occurred in this year of 2024, which has led to a contemporary global cocoa supply shortage and dramatic increases in the wholesale price of cocoa beans and chocolate as we speak. So, you see what it's gone in the past year? Anybody try to buy chocolate? If you like chocolate, you better run for it, I tell you. So anyway, what to do? The Vermont Milk Chocolate Company soon decided to shift into doing something else, and they started making a lard-like vegetable shortening product from undisclosed materials <laughs> at its new brick manufacturing uh, plant here in Burlington. Marketed as Juanetta Shortening, the product was said to be developed by my friend John Walker as a substitute for pork-based lard, which had become very expensive and was in short supply. The timing seemed to be uh, a good venture because of the, the, the shortage of the sugar and the cocoa beans. Nevertheless, it didn't really work out too well. By late in 1919, the city of Burlington was facing severe financial problems. A headline in the, in, in the free press said, city departments in financial distress. And one of the biggest financial distresses that was being put on the municipal budget came from the expense of laying that new water line down Pine Street to what was Park Avenue to serve the needs of the chocolate factory and the local neighborhoods. Because of that, Burlington Mayor J. Holmes Jackson vetoed a plan to install a new roadbed along Park Avenue, now Flynn Avenue, from Pine Street to the railroad tracks. And so there you have it, this, this ruddy dirt road as it was, stayed for who knows how many, how many more years. We're moving towards the end here. Okay, 1920, uh, there was a protest here uh, in Burlington because of the discontinuation of the electric streetcar system to the lakeside uh, 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 cotton mill factory, nevertheless, John J. Flynn, on the board of the Vermont Milk Chocolate Factory, maintained that the electric streetcars would continue to go down Flynn Avenue to that factory, which kind of upset a lot of, of the uh, cotton factory uh, workers. March uh, 20, uh, uh, 1920, uh, Ernest Linderholm, who I mentioned earlier, uh, the husband of the... Uh, of the, uh, well, his wife had become, you know, soon to become nationally uh, uh, famous for her charity work, uh, announced that he was leaving. Uh, and uh, so too, the uh, superintendent of, of the Burlington uh, factory uh, resigned. Uh, and um, perhaps not coincidentally, the Massachusetts uh, Chocolate Company in Boston quietly paid a fine without contest in U.S. Federal District Court in April 1920 for alleged violations to the federal pure food, I'm sorry, pure food and drug laws in response to charges that the company had been shipping chocolates adulterated with cocoa bean shells. Corners were perhaps being cut. It was also announced that uh, there would be a dividend paid on the preferred stock for the uh, Vermont Milk Chocolate Company uh, stockholders. But immediately, uh, there was a uh, uh, announcements were being uh, uh, put out uh, for selling more stock by the company. Let's get more investors. Nevertheless, July 1920, John Walker abruptly announced his resignation to general manager of the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company and of the Massachusetts Company. He said that uh, he'd serve as president, but it was time to take a rest 
and to get as far away from work as possible, and he would soon be taking an extended vacation voyage to South America. <laughs> so, um, so it was also soon announced in July that unemployment at that time in Berlin had been very high. The Porter Screen Company in Winooski, the American Woolen Company in Winooski, the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company, are almost all completely closed down, almost entirely. Uh, and through this, thousands of Burlingtonians have been thrown out of work, 1920. On the evening of October 29th, 1920, Fred H. Roberts, the co-founder and vice president of the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company and president of the Massachusetts Company, and numerous other business concerns, died of pneumonia at his big estate mansion in Wilmington, uh, Massachusetts. He was 65 years old. It was later reported that Fred H. Roberts had sold many of his businesses to retire shortly before his death. Berlin, uh, production did resume on a limited basis with less than 100 employees at the Vermont Milk Chocolate Factory in 1921 at seriously reduced wages, okay? John Walker came back from his extended break, offered a bleakly optimistic prognosis for the future of the company, uh, saying our troubles are gonna be over and uh, uh, we shall get through this bigger, better, with more reliable citizens, gaining strength and stability learning from lessons of the past. Nevertheless, uh, it was soon announced that his son-in-law, Ernest Lindeholm, would be leaving Burlington and moving to Boston. Uh, and uh, 1922, more serious problems evolved. In this case, in June of 1922, a complicated lawsuit seeking $800,000 was filed in US federal court in Montpelier against the Burlington firm by the Massachusetts Chocolate Company, its parent firm. In the suit, the Massachusetts Company sought control of all of the Burlington real estate, manufacturing uh, uh, machinery, trucks, raw materials, and manufacturer's goods at the Burlington site, okay? Um, but it also became clear that the millionaire co-founder, Fred H. Roberts, had, uh, because of his death, again, kind of like one of these Ponzi schemes, everything was collapsing around them, and millions and millions of, 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 of dollars were at stake, and the Massachusetts firm was on the verge of collapse, desperate for getting anything they could uh, from anywhere. It became an incredi incredibly complex legal case because John Walker, who we've heard so much about, served not only as the president and general manager of both the Burlington Chocolate Company, based chocolate company, and the Boston-based uh, 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 Massachusetts Chocolate Company, but so too had his son-in-law been the manager of this, and there was a big entanglement of the shareholders, and uh, so anyway. A huge, a huge mess, legally. Ultimately, they sought to have the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company declared bankrupt in order to have a receivership established to reorganize the firm. In a case heard in December of 1922, the United States District Court in Montpelier uh, found uh, uh, that the Massachusetts Chocolate Company's uh, petition against the Burlington Vermont Milk Chocolate Company uh, should be dismissed. The complex legal case continued to be heard uh, in uh, US District Court uh, in Montpelier through 1923. John Walker and the company's treasurer were questioned about various complex financial arrangements and bookkeeping entries uh, between the two companies including the imposition of large commissions that the Boston firm was charging on its products made by its Burlington subsidiary. It also was revealed that nearly all of the peanut oil used to manufacture the, the vegetable shortening that I mentioned here 
was made as a byproduct of producing a peanut crust that was used on chocolate bars made in Burlington, and they weren't getting, they were, the Burlington firm wasn't getting uh, paid for it. There were a whole bunch of other hidden charges and expenses that came out in the district courts. And ultimately, there was a surprise verdict that was issued on June 1st, 1923, awarding $351,502 to the Ver Vermont Milk Chocolate Company at the expense of the Massachusetts uh, uh, Chocolate Company. This was one of the largest settlements that had ever been recorded in the state of Vermont in a lawsuit at the time. Uh, so uh, soon the equipment uh, that was being used in, in, in Burlington for the lard, lard, fake lard stuff uh, was being put up for sale uh, on auction. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service uh, got involved in 1925 uh, because of unpaid taxes. Uh, and ultimately, it was announced that an amical divorce had been agreed to between the Vermont Milk Chocolate uh, Company and the Massachusetts Chocolate Company, uh, and that uh, uh, basically those shareholders in the Vermont, the Burlington-based company, would get what was here in Burlington. So uh, the Vermont uh, Milk Chocolate Company continued to run here, but not making chocolate. That was well over, okay? Uh, they, le they leased out major areas of, of, the, of the factory complex. In 1935, uh, some of the, the, the companies that were there included the Canada Broom Handle Company, Vermont Maple Orchards, uh, Westmore Savage Division of the Westinghouse Electric Supply Company, also, the Civilian Conservation Corps had leased space uh, in there. John J. Flynn, you don't know about, continued to serve as president of the uh, Vermont Milk Chocolate Factory, although they were a company, they were not making chocolate anymore, but they were the owners of the real estate. Uh, and uh, uh, so, and it continued to uh, serve in, in, in this uh, uh, way uh, well uh, until. Uh, the, through the 1930s. John Walker uh, of Belmont, Massachusetts, the founding president of the uh, Vermont Milk Chocolate Company we've talked about, he died on January 17th, uh, 1942. Uh, Charles P. Smith, one of the major investors from Burlington, died in 1937. John J. Flynn died in 1940. And in 1948, the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company's shareholders settled an agreement with their major bondholder, the John J. Flynn Estate, to sell the property to Justin Kelly and Associates. This then was the legal termination of the Vermont Milk Chocolate Company, and this was ultimately confirmed in Burlington District Court in May of 1949. Uh, the property continued to be used for a variety of manufacturing instances. It was recorded in the Vermont Historic Sites and Structure Survey as being a a, uh, of contributing to the statewide significance in 1978. In 1999, Farrington Properties uh, purchased three of the former buildings at 208 Flynn Avenue for $1.4 million. Architect Brenda Alvarez and uh, her partner, David Farrington, preserved the complex by renovating about 10,000 square feet of the old factory buildings, providing rehabilitated areas for a wide range of incubator spaces for a variety of uses. Uh, and today, uh, this rehabilitated historic factory complex at 288 Flynn Avenue serves as Burlington's one of the most vibrant business centers with a cafe, brand name studios, human services center, daycare center, warehouse space, and offices for engineers, architects, as well as for advertising, media, real estate, and development companies. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your patience. Uh, I, and I would like to acknowledge so many people who have helped out on this project, including a good number of, of work that the students have done on these projects over the years, 
the various archives that we have in the city, uh, Ethan Allen Homestead and, uh, and, 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 and so on. But what I'd like to do next is to really uh, open the floor up to you all and have what we might call a little bit of a discussion on all of this. Let's have a little seminar here. What do you think? Reactions, reactions. David. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, a couple of quick things. Um, one, um, I, when I was a young man, 18-ish, I'm now 52, so that all good. For three years, I worked for McCall's office product company. And, uh, you know, they, they were on Church Street and they moved to Cherry Street. But that whole time that I worked for them, the 70s to early 80s, they, late 70s, early 80s, three years, they had the warehouse with on Flynn Avenue, and their space was in the old Vermont shop. Yeah. And he went in, and you know, he again he used to be stressed in his presentation that you know the, the truck came in with raw materials, you know, the big huge volumes of, of paper, you know, that the that we sold, you know, and they came in by train a lot of it, and yeah. came right there, and then they get other trucks just came by truck. And, and so I, I was very familiar with the inside of the factory. It was one of my jobs to go down and get, wow. you know, wow. get some stuff that we were out of. And I worked in the retail sales and shipping in the Ontario Street. And so it was a great building. And, uh, so my cool. question is, uh, uh, sure, sure. you know, for an uh, you know, educational uh, uh, question, how did the, um, uh, did you know, come across in the research how uh, the Hershey Company sort of figured into that timeline? because. You know, they got government contracts in World War One yep. yep. to supply chocolate to, and then again in World War Two, because by that time, you know, Vermont milk chocolate was gone by the way. But did, did you come across any uh, Hershey? You know, they were obviously competitors with the Massachusetts and the Vermont milk chocolate company today. You know, that and. That's a great, really good question. You know, and and uh, my sense is that Hershey was was really very very prosperous on the domestic front, and somehow I mean these are some of these who knows what's going on behind the scenes. How the you know the Massachusetts company through the Vermont company were getting these huge government contracts. You know, it's uh, somebody had some connections, and I suspect it would have been through uh, through Roberts. Uh, he was extremely wealthy and, and powerful. But this is there's more. There's always more to a story. There's always more to a story, and this 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 would be a lot of fun to explore. Gail, do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. At least. I was just wondering if the movie Your Brothers and and the chocolate company were contemporaneous. There was kind of an overlap. The Lumiere factory, which is the next one down on on, uh, on Flynn Avenue across the tracks, and they came in. They're they're a big firm from France to make uh, uh, you know glass plate uh, negatives and so on, taking advantage of the water from the lake. And I think what it really does is it it kind of represents this era of of, of early twentieth century manufacturing that was going on, on on here with access to the to the rail and workers and so on. So it's it's fun to look at that. That, uh, that, 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 that relationship. And it was about workers. Um, the, the linear was here in 1903. Yeah, er, very early. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, it was really such a major industrial spot. Yeah. And certainly the water, the railroad, but the worker availability seemed to be a big attraction. Yeah. What have we been able to get with all this research you're probably taking? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this has been one of the, the sort of part of the story that I've been express, uh, very fascinated with, and, and perhaps one of the major sources, kind of archival sources for this that I've been tapping into have been the, the Burlington City directories. And I think from that, I mean, what we're clearly seeing by the names is a good number of the workers were coming from Quebec, uh, as well as other areas. But there are, there are many, many French names there. And it was sort of that, that period where you know, hey, let's face it, during the late 1890s, early 20th century, there were kind of rough times, uh, I think, for a lot of the Quebec population. And there was this ability for, for, uh, for workers uh, to come in, as well as from, from elsewhere. I mean, the, uh, they were advertising heavily in Rutland for workers. Uh, so it, it, was, it was really, it was really uh, kind of regional, uh, looking for workers. But again, I think what really kind of came out of this, of course, was 
okay, when you get this industry growing and you're bringing in the workers, where are they going to live? And what are we talking about today? I mean, with regard to the housing situation, you know, uh, it's affordable housing. And, and how is that being addressed and, and so on? So also, I mean, while you're there, could you tell us a little bit about how some of your recent events, I think sort of one of the sub themes that I really wanted to touch on here today is this idea of public history. You know, rather than just sort of focusing on monuments and pedestals and grand things, what we have here in this building is an amazing story about local history, the people, things that are positive and not so positive, the challenges that people went through. And I think, you know, uh, there's, there's some efforts underway to kind of broaden out some of the, some of the stories. So maybe you could share us a little bit of what's going on. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Gail Rosenberg, Alicia Gaia, and with two other women, we are trying to start Burlington History and Culture Center because the only place you can come to learn any Burlington history is here. And that's a very particular perspective on our history. I mean, we want more stories like this. We want to know about the work. We want to know about the people who actually laid the brick actually built everything and actually worked in it and that's a number of different immigrant groups um, so we're really as we are on um, first year of a three-year grant from the vermont humanities um, we got ten thousand dollars a year for three years to build a community vision for this center and we're on the first year right now we're having um, focus groups and interviews I know many of you signed your email in the front. If it would be okay with you, we would love to um, reset those emails. Send you a survey. The survey is to find out what are the stories that you want to see um, in the um, What are the best ways to present them? And we, at this moment, don't have a particular space in mind. Uh, well, we have many in mind. But we have a center, a hub, we have satellites through the city, um, and not just looking at having all the history in the building, but that we're looking we at the world building, maybe. You know, so, yeah, we don't know. So, um, we are very happy to talk to anyone who will send you some information. We'd love to get back your feedback. Um, and what this is, is not going to be a museum of the four co-founders, it's a museum of the community, what in Burlington do we need to know? And the industrial part of the area that Tom talked about is just exciting. It's one of many sites in the city where charter things are happening. And we want to know about the people who did the building. Well, and thank you so much for the Ethan on Homestead. I mean, for, for you know, catering today, <laughs> bringing us all together, because I really hope that this is a catalyst. I mean, you, you well, folks this do... is very exciting for us. I think yeah. we, we apologize for going over, but I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll cut the question short then and uh, go and have some it, treats. Huh? And I know that some people have to go because, you know, they have other things to do. And right. we, we usually just do the hour, but it's been so wonderful for Elise and Gail to get up and be able to explain what's going on because what else is the Ethan Allen Homestead right. about except everything that's gone on in Burlington. So I think this is just exciting that, you know, the people are here and at the beginning of this so that we can perhaps help in, you know, each other in very yeah, in various ways. Sure. So I encourage anybody to thank all the yeah, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.